actual training as well. Now, I hope you enjoy the learning lab. Um, now, I'm, I'm of course happy to stop and take questions at any time. Uh, I'm going to be hitting you with lots of information, so um, please feel free to either unmute and, and just and just shout at me uh, at any point of time, uh, or you can stick something in the chat box and that should pop up, and I'll I'll be able to pick that up as I go along. So. Uh, First of all, uh, just a quick overview of, of what I'm going to speak about today. Uh, I'm going to start with um, the first educational segment of the lab, uh, and this is really focused around looking at um, what the pressures of COVID has, has done to place um, difficulty on surgical training and, and how we're seeing surgical training change uh, as a result of this. Now, I must say that a lot of that is related to things here in the UK, but I'm sure a lot of that difficulty is, is also translated overseas. I'm then going to move on to an introduction of LAP AR and give you an overview of the simulator, uh, its main functionality, um, and of course the package options that we offer with that. Um, now, whilst there's a lot of very cool technology underpinning the LAP AR, uh, there is a huge amount of functionality in, in the software and more specifically the web application, which you'll see um, drives our connected learning. Um, so we're going to spend some really good time working through uh, this element of the platform and, and show you how LAP AR um, is really Really geared for the future of surgical training, uh, not only now in, in the COVID world, but in the post-COVID world. Uh, and then to finish off, we're actually going to return back to an educational element, uh, and we're going to give a real-time example of how LAP AR is already being used to combat the new demands on, on surgical training um, during COVID-19. Um, so in terms of, for, to start off from an educational standpoint, I'm sure we've all thought about the impact that um, COVID could have on surgical training, um, but I, I felt that now would be a good time to take a step back and, and really review the, the current literature on this subject uh, and take stock of, uh, of what will be, uh, we, we feel, a major issue for medical educators globally, educators globally um, both now and in the future. So during COVID-19, we, we quite rightly as, as healthcare providers have focused our services on provision, uh, on saving lives uh, of those suffering with COVID. Uh, and of course, the issue we found as a result of this uh, has been published uh, across the evidence base. And I think this evidence that we're seeing now is going to become more and more prolonged every day that the pandemic goes on and we're, we're focusing our, our services primarily on the fight against COVID-19. Uh, and so really, what, what does that result in in terms of the landscape of surgical training looking like both, both now and in the future? Well, as you can see from this slide, um, th th there's really three major elements to consider here. Uh, the first is the, the impact COVID has had on, on the traditional, what we call on the job training, um, that, that sort of in theatre training with, with cancellation of elective and, and non-emergency surgery, uh, resulting in the day-to-day -day training case for residents and, and surgical registrars not taking place. Now, whilst the effect um, that this can have on the element of training is, is mainly isolated to, to the acute pandemic itself, that there are longer term repercussions which we'll look at as we go along. In the short term, uh, these effects mean that residents are not able to get the necessary in-surgery, in-theatre training experience to maintain and progress their skills. Uh, and the second uh, element um, that, that we're seeing as a result of COVID is um, the extremely important out of theatre training. So, so our, our structured courses and simulation centres uh, and the fact that, that COVID-19 um, is really impacting on this as well. We can see here from, uh, from, from the top right um, and then the second excerpt that the, the literature is showing is that the courses and educational events are being postponed until further notice. That's, that's primarily here in the UK, but again, as I say, I'm sure elsewhere. Um, and anecdotally, uh, we're hearing from our customers um, that when our training centers and sim centers do reopen, that will be with major restrictions, limiting the number of people that are able to train at one time. Uh, and finally, we must, we must also consider the impact of redeployment on surgical skills. So uh, with the majority of residents or trainees being moved uh, away from uh, carrying out operations to support their critical care and medical colleagues, uh, the, the trainees are not being afforded the opportunity to scrub for emergency cases uh, and therefore keep their skills at baseline. So as, as all you can imagine, these quite necessary measures that have been taken to help tackle COVID in the acute phase will have a potentially profound effect on surgical training. And uh, the various bodies for, for surgical education and training across the globe, uh, including those in the UK and the USA, are already releasing statements to drive home the level of impact they feel this could have. Now, as we've seen, surgical trainees will... Um, uh, 
have a, a significantly reduced number of caseloads due to the non-emergency surgery being uh, being cancelled, and their redeployment compounds this further with residents being unable to scrub for the emergency lists. So these changes will not only cause what we call skills fade, but actually the, effectively a complete stop in operating, see an immediate decay in skill, um, uh, meaning that residents um, uh, are really becoming de-skilled very quickly. So um, some have uh, commented that the, the backlog of cases that are sort of being created due to this scenario could represent a great training opportunity for residents to catch up with the lost cases. However, we know that really this backlog is growing at such a pace and to such a volume that uh, many feel that when the, uh, the, the non-emergency surgery recommences that it will be the more senior surgeons that will be working on this and as such, these won't be training opportunities for the trainees. Now, regardless of what the training opportunities may well be for residents and, and registrars uh, when we do get going again, um, the, we, <laughs> We know that the the, edges, the measures that are going to be there to ease them back into theatre uh, will still limit the amount of operating that they can do. And so really we view this as um, our responsibility as, as the simulation um, uh, providers to provide a platform that allows residents to not only maintain their skills and prevent that skills fade I've already mentioned, um, but allow them to safely reskill as they are returning to theatre and providing surgical care. So um, that's, that's the background to, to where we stand with surgical training uh, currently. And don't worry, um, the screen hasn't malfunctioned. That is supposed to be black. I'm going to play a video for you in a moment. Uh, um, uh, and really, what, what's the solution to this? Well, we see LAP AR as, as a major solution to this problem. Um, and so introducing LAP AR, it's, it's the culmination of nearly two years of, of research and development by us here at um, Innovus Medical. Uh, and the project itself has been funded by the NHS. Now, the reason the NHS has funded the development um, was that they realized even before COVID that we really do need to make significant changes to the way that we deliver surgical education uh, and training. And so they tasked us here at Innovus uh, with developing a surgical simulation platform that was focused on improving access to high quality, high fidelity simulation um, for really good quality and really large scale preoperative training and warm up. Now, I think to get a really uh, good feel uh, for the need we're solving here with LAP AR, a quick idea of what the output of that project um, would be via a video is, is the best way to get you suited to this. So I'm going to play a video here. Hopefully it projects. Please put a comment in if you can't hear it or see it.
Um, so uh, just just a note, sir. I've just pause my videos. I'm getting a, a few bandwidth issues, so hopefully that's not uh, affecting you guys your end. And I'll um, hopefully come back to, uh, to to the video function once we're through the the presentation and the um, and the screen sharing. So um, hopefully I've given you a, a really good, uh, very much a whistle stop tour to Lap AR, and, and has given you a little bit of an idea of what it does. But really, that video is there to give you an idea of the problems that we see we're solving with this technology. Um, and those really are threefold. So that's um, the three uh, words you can see at the bottom of each of our slides. So accessibility being one, um, we know that traditionally our, our, our traditional high fidelity systems are often very large and bulky and, and confined to surgical simulation centers. Affordability is important for us here in the UK and we know elsewhere. Um, and as we'll maybe touch on later, uh, we certainly solve that. And then functionality being one, and we, we know that um, VR is very popular in healthcare simulation, but um, as clinicians and, and surgeons ourselves, we also understand the importance of uh, making sure that those haptics, that feel of the tissues and the instruments in your hand is, is highly realistic and, and, and as close to real life as we can. And, and hopefully you saw very quickly on that video that um, we've gone about solving that final issue um, in, a, in, a, in a pretty innovative, innovative, innovative way, sorry, um, utilizing soft tissue models and instruments. And, and I'll come back onto that momentarily. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about here really is that accessibility uh, play. And, and as you can see here on the screen, uh, I wanted to highlight that by showing that we have both an institutional and a take-home model. As you can see here, that the take-home model is, is your, your basic box trainer, but still delivering everything you've just seen on screen. And that's able to um, work with a standard off-the-shelf laptop. And then to the right-hand side on, on the screen here, you can see an example of the institutional system, a, a more traditional trolley system, but with a few um, unique elements. So, um, of course, the system there is uh, fully adjustable in its height so that we're promoting good surgeon ergonomics. But what you can also do is convert that trolley system into a tabletop setup. Um, so that allows you to take the screen and clamp it to a table, put the box trainer on top of that table and actually place the trolley element, the base unit underneath the table. And that was actually a, a spec requirement from the NHS funders um, due to the, the issues we have with space, both in universities and hospitals here in the UK. And we know that um, space is a premium elsewhere. So hopefully that slide gives you an idea of the, the fact that we've got two elements of, of hardware take home and, and institutional uh, but I just wanted to share some screenshots of the actual simulations themselves as I appreciate that um, when, when you first see this technology um, and, and actually I'll give a, a story here uh, we showed this to a surgeon here in the UK having explained that we're using uh, medical models and digital overlays and it's augmented reality uh, and we showed him that video and said well Elliot that's all well and good but that's just a virtual reality simulator so hopefully I can explain a little bit more about uh, the, the difference in what we're doing here. So uh, on the left of, of, of the screen right now, you can see an example of our, our lap Coley model. Um, and you can see here that the instrument is in screen and that's actually holding on to uh, the soft tissue model element of this simulation. So um, you can see there that you're using a real instrument, you're gaining a real feel for tissue tension and, and tissue planes. Um, but then to the top left, you can see the digital overlay. So um, that's our digital environment, which provides um, an extremely immersive and, and very realistic environment for operating. And again, on the right hand side, another example, this is one of our gyne modules, so a, a vaginal vault closure task. And the central element here, again, is a, a soft tissue model. So it gives that real feel of, of tissue and, uh, and tissue tensions. And surrounding that is the digital env environment, so the pelvic anatomy. Uh, and, and again, another thing to say here is that not only is LAP AR or using augmented reality, so the combination of uh, real field tissues uh, and a real digital environment, but we're also using some really clever um, computer vision technology, and that computer vision technology allows us to do a few things. One of those is tracking the instruments, uh, and as you're going to see when I show you the, the web application element of this uh, technology, providing a really rich data source for tracking and feeding back on surgical performance. But the, the computer vision also allows us to um, action on screen buttons, which you would have seen a very um, brief example of in that last video. So that allows um, us to um, train surgeons in the cognitive elements of the procedure as well as uh, the, the physical skills. So um, hopefully that does give you a feel for the technology uh, in terms of the, the, the packages we have, the fact that they're really delivered on what look like basic box trainers, but provide a um, technology and an experience which is so much more. Um, 
I, I appreciate that there's probably quite a lot of information that I've flooded you with there. So I'd be happy to pause and take any questions or queries or, or go back and, and, and clear anything up. If anyone has any queries at this stage, please do unmute and give me a shout. Um, and, I'll, and then I'll, uh, I'll move on if there's, if there's no queries at this time. No, sounds like everyone's uh, pretty happy. Um, okay, well, I'm just gonna show another video then. And um, the next video I'm going to show you uh, is an example less of the problems we're solving and, and um, what the technology does from a, from a physical standpoint, but more around how LAP AR really provides this concept of connected surgical training, which uh, as I mentioned, and, and with, with, with the nature of this uh, presentation uh, around COVID really helps solve the issue with uh, the fact that we're not able to gather as much for training. So I'm going to play that for you now. Lab AR is the platform for connected surgical training, promoting collaborative education for better patient care. With a full suite of modules, all surgical specialties, and a take-home version that allows training without boundaries. Simple to set up. And with our distance learning app, trainers can guide learning outcomes from anywhere in the world. Haptic feedback is generated by medical models and real instruments. And performance tracking shows progression and guides further training needs. Record live training events and receive written timestamped feedback. Download performance data and add it to your portfolio. Lab AR, connected training for better patient care. Okay, so um, I'm just going to pause there because we've got a couple of questions in, in, um, in the chat there. So the first one from Jane. So thank you, Jane, for that. Um, the, the question, if people, others can't see it, is does the system incorporate a HoloLens virtual view? Um, so, so thanks for that, Jane. That's, that's a great question. And, and the answer is no. Um, and this is one of the innovative elements of this, of this platform. So traditionally, when we're thinking about VR or, or AR, um, that is generally requiring um, not only either a HoloLens or, um, uh, or a different VR headset, but often requires extremely high-powered um, gaming computers to run all of those graphics. So actually, the, the, the view that you're seeing when we're performing the surgery and performing the simulation is streamed directly onto screen. So actually, if I come back a few slides, um, for the institutional system, um, that's being streamed directly onto the screen you see on the trolley on the right hand side and the computer is actually built inside the trolley system so you don't need a computer you don't need any um, virtual headsets uh, and so this makes it actually much uh, much more comfortable to use but again much more realistic to real life because as we know when we're operating in real life we're streaming um, our, our 3d procedure on a 2d screen um, so that's how that works for the institutional version. And to the point of the take home version, again, it's the same scenario, no need for a headset. Um, we stream directly through the, the laptop that it's attached to. Uh, and also um, uh, we've had some, some great feedback this week in that um, we've been using the systems with our first users here in the UK. Um, and for anyone that doesn't know the UK healthcare system, the computers that um, you get in the NHS um, are, are are ancient and archaic and, and can barely load word or email and i'm pleased to say that actually the the ar element of this system is working with a with with, with the the standardized pcs and systems that we have in the nhs so to reiterate no headsets they work with relatively low spec computers we do have a minimum spec which i'm happy to share um, with anyone that would like to be um to, to gain more information on that um, again, there's a, another question here. Um, so thank you very much for, for these guys and, and do, do keep them coming throughout. Um, is there a module related to cardiovascular surgery? Um, the answer to that is right now, no. 
Um, I'll touch on, uh, in, in a couple of slides uh, from now, I'll touch on the, the modules that we have already. At the moment, they are focused on general surgery, gynecology surgery, and generic um, non um, surgical or non specialty specific stuff. So um, we, we utilize the LAPPASS tasks, which is the UK's version of FLS. Um, the, the next pipeline um, specialty is urology. And of course, cardiovascular surgery is also there. Um, and I'll talk about how um, scalable this platform is for you as the end users. And in fact, I'll talk about that now. Um, when we add in the future new modules, so uh, for the cardiovascular modules, for example, there will not be a charge for a new module. Um, you pay your fee, and we'll touch on the fees uh, later on and, and, and put that in the Q&A at the end. Um, but as long as you're paying your annual fee, when a new module becomes available, you do not have to pay to access it. And actually, all you need to do is make sure that you buy or, or call down um, the medical model that you're operating on. Um, so uh, in this case, this would be the lap Coley model or the vaginal vault model. And you just ask for that to be sent to you to perform whichever procedure it is. So um, I'm not sure if that's come across particularly clearly, but I'll, I'll, I'll circle back around a bit later on. Um, okay, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to come out and show you another page. So hopefully that... Um, hopefully that's projecting okay. Olivia, please let me know in the chat or, or, or pipe up if that's not, um, if that's not working. Um, so I mentioned there, guys, uh, that, that um, the LAP AR is, is augmented reality and it's driving that augmented reality either off a laptop or, or the computer that is built into the, the LAP AR trolley. Um, and actually what we have here is two very distinct pieces of software. We have the software that allows you to see the, the AR image and stream the AR image and that is tracking the instruments. Uh, and then we have what we call our web app or our online training portal, which is what I'm gonna show you here. And this is where it starts becoming really, really exciting. So this application here is, is entirely um, online. So it's, it's entirely web-based, which means that you can access this from anywhere. You do not have to be on the simulator to be able to, um, to, to, be able to access it. Um, and what that truly does is it allows a fully connected and very versatile training experience. And it's the web app here that I'm going to show you, which is where all of the data that we're collecting um, uh, when we're performing the, surgery, the surgeries and the simulations is collected and aggregated and worked on. So um, there's an important thing to note here that um, you, you can look at this platform as the trainer, so uh, the proctor delivering the training, or the trainee. And, and I would like to look at it um, from the, the trainer, so the person that is delivering the training and, and, and driving the training. So that, in this case, would be Ross Davis. So that would be the lead trainer here. And this is Ross's landing page when you log in. And as I mentioned, you can log in anywhere that you've got a, uh, an internet connection. Uh, and once you have logged in um, on the landing page, Ross can actually see his own statistics for his own training, um, which sit down the right hand side here. But very importantly, um, we make it available such that um, when you buy the LAP AR Pro, um, you have the function to connect with others. Uh, and that comes back again to this idea of connected surgical training. And here you can see connections. So these are Ross's connections that, he's, uh, that he has in the platform. Um, not only can you see individual connections here, but there is also the ability to go to groups um, and you can uh, create groups so that you could group people by their year of training or by a company that they're, they're in or by various training programs. So the beauty of connections is it allows us to see how someone else's training is going on. So if you remember the, the animated explainer that we've just seen, uh, there's the example of the, uh, the resident at the hospital doing the training with their consultant on the LAP AR Pro, um, and they've learned lots of good things, and then they want to go home and carry on their training. And so in that scenario, they're going to keep training on their take-home system, and it's going to be creating a load of training data and performance data that their consultant or trainer would like to see. And so in this scenario, Ross, as the trainer, wants to go and see how one of his, um, uh, his trainees is doing. So he wants to go and see how Jordan is getting on. And he can click on his name. And then as you can see here, this shows us the performance data and the performance metrics for Jordan for the platform. 
Now, um, one of the questions was, are there any cardiovascular um, related tasks? Um, and my answer, of course, was no. And I'll, I'll use this time before I go through the statistics um, to show you the, the uh, different tasks that we do have. So on the statistics page, and, and this is how you would view your statistics if it was yourself as the trainee, um, you can get an overview of what modules we already have. Um, so there are four general surgery modules at launch. Um, we already have six gynecology modules, including a full total laparoscopic hysterectomy. And then you can see here on the right, um, LapPass. And LapPass is the UK version of FLS. So this is basic instrument handling um, from tubal ligation, um, some precision cutting, and then all the way through to suturing. Um, and, and this is uh, agnostic to specialty. So this could be used for gynecology or general surgery training. Uh, one thing to mention is the way the platform is set up is we are able to um, integrate um, other countries or other people's or societies um, training curricula into this platform. So, for example, uh, if um, Sages wanted us to add FLS into this platform, then we can add the FLS modules and they would appear here. And for the future, as I mentioned, as urology modules are added or as cardiovascular modules are added, you would see those sitting here on the stats page. So I'm just going to come again then and say, um, as, as the trainer, as Ross Davis, I, I, want, I want to go and look at how my, um, my trainees are getting on. And here is the statistics page for that trainee. You can see here that it's showing all procedures, but we can, um, we can look at just appendicectomy, for example. In this case, the trainee has done two procedures with a total of five minutes of training. Um, or we can go back to all procedures for, um, uh, for an overview of all the stats. Now, our, our platform at the moment uh, allows us to track six key performance metrics. So that's completion time, i.e. how long is it taking me to perform these surgeries? And here you can see an average score, and that's compared to the average score for everyone in the platform. As, as time goes on and we have more users for this globally, um, and please, please note that this was launched in July of this year. So as we gain more uh, users, we will give people the option to compare not only to the global average, um, but uh, much more distinct averages. So uh, averages for various years of training uh, will be able to um, be reviewed. And, and we know when we're looking at scores that, that a mean or average score is useful, but we also know it's important to show uh, progression over time and show a trend. So we allow you to um, go between average scores and trend over time for all procedures. Um, then we have a couple of metrics, uh, which, we, which are really our, um, our performance metrics. So how well are we actually doing the operation? So that's smoothness, as we see here, distance traveled, and acceleration. These are all very important metrics around how well we're handling the instruments, how safely we're operating. Uh, and of, of course, we know that they're also related to the OSAT scoring system, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later on. Then we have uh, another safety metric, which for me uh, is extremely important, which is time in view. We know that we want the instruments to be on screen for as long as possible because time off screen can increase the risk of causing injury. And so we can track that. And then finally, we can show whether or not we're left or right hand dominated, uh, dominating for a procedure, uh, which again is very important when we're giving feedback on how to operate. Now, for those interested in research, we know that we can um, take this data, which is currently aggregated in, in, in these graphs here, which is not that useful to manipulate. Um, so we allow you to export the data to CSV or Excel file so that you can um, go back and you can manipulate the data for any local research you wish. Um, but you can also print this data as a, as a PDF or, or download as a, D, as a PDF um, and utilize that as a certificate. So that's a very quick uh, overview of the data you can see. Again, I just want to hammer home how important it is and how useful the function is that I am here looking at the data of someone that I am connected with. So I do not have to be in the same room or the same state or even the same country, and I can see how someone's training is progressing. Uh, the next important question is, well, how do we guide training and how do we uh, make sure that the, the people are doing the things that we want them to? And that comes into the task management bar here. So. Um, you, you see we can do multiple procedures, so um, uh, appendicectomies, we can do lapoles, 
Um, but when I'm connected with someone and I want to make sure that they're doing a certain number of procedures over time, this is where we, um, we do that in this task management um, platform. So we can set a task to, to allocate. So in this case, it may be an appendicectomy. We can choose how many it would be. So 10, we can select a, a, a user. So we may want to select Jake in this scenario and we can hit a deadline date of a couple of weeks and then hit create task. And that's going to drop that task down into here set for Jake. So the great thing about this is that you can, over time, see how many people, um, how many tasks the person that you've set has done. So for the trainee at the other end with their simulator, um, they will get a notification uh, or an alert saying that you have been um, set a task. And then you will go away and do your tasks on your local software, or your local platform. And each time that that person does a task, it will count it here. So one out of five, two out of five, three out of five, four out of five, and then completed. When it's completed, it will turn green and you'll see all the tasks are in green. The incomplete ones will remain red. Uh, the, the power of this, this task management is not only guiding people's training, but if you imagine you are a consultant or a, a, a senior surgeon who has many trainees and you've set them lots and lots of tasks, um, it would be very difficult to go into their statistics page and try and vet out the tasks they've done. Whereas here you can see, okay, this person has completed the task I've asked for. Um, this person's a long way behind. I can give them a nudge. So it's a really useful platform um, for, for making sure that we're guiding the training in the right way. So that's a, a quick overview of how not only tasks and guide training, but also we see how people's um, objective skills are progressing. But one thing we mustn't forget is that as a distance learning platform, um, we, mustn't, we mustn't lose the importance of the subjective feedback. So that's the expert surgeon reviewing live game footage, having the ability to not only review that, but um, provide, uh, provide feedback in a, in a time-stamped manner. And that's where we have the video review function. So in the other uh, software application, uh, before you operate, you have the chance to select to record a video. It won't automatically record every single task because of course we'd end up with thousands and thousands of uh, hours of, of video um, that people may not need or want. So once you have selected to record a video, uh, that will get sent up here in the web app. And then you can press play and you can re-watch what you've done. So uh, if you're the, the, the training surgeon yourself, you're able to go back and, and, and look through uh, the video. But however, if you would like more expert-led feedback, what you can then do is send a feedback invitation. You could either send a, a group of people or you can send that uh, feedback invitation to an individual and you would hit the invite button and that would show that the invitation has gone successfully. And that would appear on the other person's end here in, in the alert section. Um, so there'd be video review invitations that have come in here. And for example, if I'm the senior surgeon and I've got a video review invitation, I'm going to click view there. And hopefully this has got a video that will load. Um, I apologize if it doesn't. Um, let me just click on that. There we go. So that there may be a bit of a, a bandwidth lag there. But what you're going to see here is this video will now start playing. And I, as the, as the video reviewer, the senior surgeon, may want to start typing. So uh, the minute I start typing, so uh, bring left hand in, you can see here that as soon as I've started typing, it has paused the video and it allows me to carry on writing my comment. And I can add that comment into the feed. So bring left hand in here. And then I can carry on reviewing the video. And I can let that run a bit longer and we'll let some instruments come into play. Just, to, just to, to, while we're watching this video and letting this play, you can see here that this is a, a real laparoscopic needle holder um, uh, from one brand. And then there is another laparoscopic needle holder from another brand in the other side. That shows you that this is a direct view of the instruments. These are not digital avatars. They're not the simulated instruments. These are the real instruments holding a real um, needle and, 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 and suture, suturing through real field tissue. Um, so hopefully that gives you a good idea of that. But if I want to provide some more feedback, um, I could say, uh, let go of needle faster. And again, I've let, once I started typing my, my timestamp feedback, it pauses the video. I can add my comment and then I can go back to reviewing the video 
uh, and providing that feedback. And then once that feedback has been delivered, um, the, the trainee who has sent it will be able to view that back in their video library um, with the various comments and feedback that may well sit in that video. So um, that is a very, very quick uh, whistle-stop tour to uh, the web platform. And we've got a question one second, bear with me all. Um, so there's a great question here. So from Comrade, thank you very much, Comrade. So uh, is, is there a requirement for, for trainers to use the system before giving subjective expert feedback? Um, if so, any minimum number per procedure? Uh, uh, no, no, there isn't uh, um, a requirement for them to, to, to use it before giving the expert feedback. So I think what you're getting at there probably is um, before choosing to record, uh, please Comrade, correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, feel free to unmute and correct me. Um, but uh, that that I'm reading into is the question is before they choose to record and send the video for review um, do we have to benchmark their their abilities um, so that the expert is not receiving lots and lots of videos no the answer is no um, but what we would tend to see and and I'll give you a, an example of this actually uh, in in one of the final slides is that the trainers the expert surgeons will say to um, their training surgeons I want you to do 10 of this, 10 of this, 10 of this, and 10 of this. And on the 10th one, I would like you to record it and send that to me for review. So there is no absolute requirement. And we really leave that open to, um, to guidance by whoever is, is delivering the training and, and running the sessions, because we don't want to pigeonhole people into, into doing that. Um, hopefully, yeah. that's, that's answered it. Is, was that... Was yeah, that sorry, uh, I, was, I was asking the question from the perspective of um, you know, just for the for the trainers to get a feel of what the trainees go through, even if it's only once. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more for me? Sorry. Well, I mean, the the trainers would have had experience of for many years with live patients, so they have they have a sense of what the trainees may be undergoing, and they may have used previous previous simulators, um, they may have used previous simulators um, before before the, your system is coming up. So it's, it's, just to, it's just to check whether it might be useful for trainers to get a feel of what the trainees are going through or feeling when they're using the system. Oh yes, no, I'm with you. Yeah, so that's that's absolutely yeah. That's that's a good that's a good point. And and yes, we we encourage that. So um, actually, I I, um, I I stopped I stopped uh, screen sharing that a bit too early. Let me come back um, into the web app for you. Um, and ho uh, hopefully everyone um, is with myself and Conrad on question there. So I've been showing you this web app from the perspective of the the trainer, the expert surgeon. In this case, Ross. And, and he was going in and looking at, at Jordan's performances and Jordan's videos. But actually what you'll see here is these total procedures and, and hours, these are actually done by Ross, that he's the expert surgeon. So he is also able to operate on the system because as, the, as an administrator or, 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 or trainer, um, they will also have full access to, to the simulator. So they're able to yeah, perform the simulations themselves. And as you rightly say, if to give really accurate um, feedback and written feedback, they, they do need to understand what the pressures are that the, the trainees are experiencing. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And the answer is, is yes. Uh, and I think that's also up to the expert surgeon as to how many of each of the procedures they do before they feel comfortable saying, I can give really good feedback on, on why they may be doing this well or, or this well. Is, is that, does that answer the, the question? Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's perfect. No problem. Um, Right, and okay, no further questions at the moment. As I say, please feel free to um, feel, feel free to ask questions anytime. So um, I'm just going to come back here, back into the presentation. So excellent. So I, I know that's a lot of information, and I appreciate that. And I do want to make sure we have some time for some some full Q and A at the end, but. Um, one thing I wanted to do is, is, is really give everyone a feel for how is this system already being used. Um, so I thought we'd bring the educational element back in and actually deliver a, a, a sort of case study on, on, on the educational power of the system. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do that by, by giving you an overview of how one of our customers is using it. 
Um, now, this particular customer is here in the UK and runs regular Katapa based courses. Um, and, and those are normally run uh, as a residential course over two days um, at various simulation centers in the United Kingdom. Um, and now here in the UK, we, we continue to have very tight restrictions. Um, so face to face training is, is just not possible at the moment. Um, and so as a result, our customer decided to replace all of the practical elements of their course, uh, which would usually involve cadaver labs, um, and they replaced that with the lap AR. So, so what they found was um, that this actually added value to the course. Um, and, and, and they looked at it and said, well, actually, this, this adds value to the course regardless of if COVID was here. And I'll, I'll talk to you about how, how that happened. So um, the way they set this up is they, they sent out 24 of the take-home AR systems to their delegates in their delegates' homes. Um, now, one thing I have to mention is to be able to do the connections and the video review and the task setting, you must have a, an institutional or LAP AR Pro system because that gives you that that software functionality. So this customer had the LAP AR Pro system in, in their training center where, where the, the consultant trainers could be. And as I say, they sent the, the take home systems out to the homes of the delegates. And then the faculty and delegates connected with each other. The, the faculty then um, set each of the delegates a, uh, an agreed number of tasks. Uh, and in this case, it was five of each of our basic LAP pass tasks and five of our general surgery tasks, because this, in this case, it was a general surgery course that they were doing. And they set all of those tasks for the trainees. And at the same time, um, to, to Conrad's um, point, they asked them on the, on the fifth go, on the fifth go of each of these, to record and send a video for review. Um, and so they did that as part of the pre-course. So this is an element of training that had never existed before um, for, for these practical courses. They also then utilized the system um, for, for, for remote proctoring of the actual course. So um, the trainees did all these tasks before the course started. And then on the days of the courses, all of the trainees logged in um, and they logged into Zoom. And then they were able to go through some proctored consultant expert led simulations where the experts were actually operating on their simulator and live streaming that through Zoom. Um, now, that live stream functionality is, is something we utilize through Zoom at the moment and, and may well get incorporated into the platform itself in the future. But where it was really, really important was that it did allow those trainees to have uh, the expert showing them, again, to Conrad's point, how do you actually perform this simulation to the best possible standards? What we also then did is we allowed the, uh, the proctors to, to go into the subgroups and work with their trainees to review the videos. So because the, um, all of the pre-course work had been done and the videos had been already shot, the, um, the, the faculty were able to review those videos in advance, do all of the time-stamped written feedback, and then in breakout sessions, they re-reviewed that with the feedback as they went. But you can also imagine that if you wanted to do this completely distanced without proctoring, there's also the ability, uh, the ability to do that. Um, what we also wanted to look at with, with our customer, and they were very keen to do this, was to utilize the LAP AR to not only provide more training in, in the pre-course element, and also carry on delivering a practical course with, with proctors. But they also wanted to look at how does the implementation of proctored consultant expert led training lead to an improvement in skill. So what we did at the end of the course is we asked all of the trainees to again repeat all of the tasks on their take home simulator and record their final attempt and send that recorded final attempt again back to the trainers to review. And what that allowed the customer to show was that the use of LAP AR had a benchmarks uh, performance, both um, with the objective data and the subjective video review. We introduced the proctored training and then we re-benchmarked their skill. And what we're actually, um, anecdotally, we haven't actually um, uh, gone into a really deep dive on the data, but what we're anecdotally seeing is that the repeated and, uh, and long-term use of LAP AR across these courses is resulting in um, improvement in skill, not only objectively in the data, but subjectively from the video review as well. So that's really, really exciting. Um, so following, following this sort of pilot and use of this, uh, this system, 
uh, our customer has actually gone away and decided to rewrite their national training program um, to incorporate LAP AR for the future. That includes when we are clear of COVID and back to cadaver based labs because they understand the importance of the, the pre course work, the increased amount of practical skills we can train at scale, and the ability to actually show how much of a difference a program um, or a cadaver course makes to, to surgical skill and, uh, and the trainee's performance. So I, I hope that that case study gives you a feel um, for, for some of the amazing ways that the LAP AR can be used uh, to help reskill during COVID, but also uh, produce a, a scalable way of delivering surgical training uh, well into the future. And it's at that point that um, I will say thank you very much um, for, for listening. Uh, and I, I, would, I would welcome any questions and I'll bring my, I'll bring my video back on and hope that the bandwidth um, manages to, to cope with that. Okay, so another question from Comrade. Thank you, Comrade, for this. Um, so the question here for everyone is, are there evidence-based expected target times for performance of learners or are learners measured against themselves? Another great question. Thank you, Comrade. So um, I, I mentioned um, when we were going through that, that at the moment you can benchmark your average score against all of the users in the platform because we've got um, still a relatively small number of users and, and a relatively small number of data sets given this has um, been going since July. Um, but the answer to that is yes, as we get enough users, not only will we benchmark and so show that this is the, um, the score that you should get if you're an expert user and how do you compare against the expert user, but we will show the average score you should be attaining for the number of years of, of surgical training that you're in. So that allows you to benchmark against the, the, the mean scores of, of, of different grades. Uh, and then of course you're able to, to benchmark against your own performance and see how your performance is changing over time. Any other questions? A question from, from Jane. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't get on to pricing. So th th thank you for that. I got carried away with talking about the functionality. So uh, how does the pricing for use of the system compare to other LAP VR systems? You mentioned an annual fee. Does the customer purchase the models individually? This is, this is a lovely question. I'm, I'm going to ask it. Thank you. Um, if we look at those three words at the bottom of the, all of our slides, um, the one in the middle we really take very seriously. Um, and that is because in the, in the UK and for the NHS, where, as we say, this, the, the, the development of this product has been funded by, there are limited financial resources. And so the answer to this is, is considerably less expensive. So I'll talk you through uh, the pricing. And please forgive me, this is, this is in pounds. And uh, I'm well aware that we've got some of our distribution partners uh, from across the US here. Um, this is the pounds price in the UK. Um, uh, but effectively, we have the, for the institutional system, the LAP AR Pro, there is a capital purchase of that of, of just 22,000 pounds, which when you consider versus the incumbent VR systems, which are all £100,000 plus um, is a fifth of the capital price. Um, so not only is the capital much more affordable, and I have to caveat, we have not compromised on functionality. I will, I will stand by the technology as, as having a more realistic feel um, and, and a better training experience than VR because of the use of the instruments and the models. So the question will be, well, how have you improved functionality and reduced the price massively? Um, it helps having had financial backing to develop it from the NHS. Uh, we've taken a very contrarian approach and as I say it's the use of the models and real instruments which means that we're able to take a lot of the cost out of the traditional VR systems. So the capital price is much more affordable and the annual fee is a fixed annual fee and this is £9,000 and you get four things as part of that. So <clears throat> you get a bank of 360 medical models and those medical models, um, you don't have to decide what ratio of appendix to gallbladder to sarcoinjectomy models you have. Um, you can do a cool down of models once per month. And that's included in that price. 
and you can do that in the, in the web app system that you've seen. So if one month you know that you need 20 appendix models and 10 gallbladders, then you can call that down. If it's the next month you need 20 salpingectomies and, and five vaginal vaults, then you can call that down. Um, once you get to 360 models, if you've used them all, um, uh, once, you, once you get through that, then that's where you would need to buy extra models. And the models themselves are very reasonably priced. So they're between 20 and 25 pounds for a single unit. Um, also included in that annual fee, um, uh, and Jane, I see that question, yeah, and I'll come on to that, thank you. Also included in that annual fee along with, uh, along with the models, um, you get unlimited user licenses to give to people within your site or, or, or your institution. So um, the, the, the thinking behind that is so that when you buy a, a LAP AR Pro system, we want you to be buying the take home LAP AR as well. And so that you can give the take home LAP AR to the trainees and they can take that away but that you don't have to pay a license for each of them to access it. So when you buy the central hub system, you can then give out licenses to all your trainees and there is no extra fee for that. And it gives you all the functionality I've just shown you. There are a couple more things that you get with the annual fee. You get tech support. So we've gone away from this traditional model of servicing and charging you servicing fees when maybe something doesn't need servicing. So if there is a problem, we provide tech support. The majority of that is provided and can be resolved via Zoom. Um, if there is a resolution that needs to be made that can't be made by Zoom, then we have a great network of on the ground engineers and experts, um, both across North America and Europe who are able to, to attend and fix something. And if something does need fixing, you don't pay for it because you've paid your annual fee. And so it's up to us to fix that. So um, to, to uh, hopefully that makes sense, but to summarize, there is the capital, which is one fifth of the price of our, our VR competitors. And you have a very transparent fixed annual fee, <clears throat> which gets you four things, medical models, 360, unlimited user licenses uh, and users. It gets you tech support and it gets you effectively warranty cover or replacement parts if they are needed. Um, of course, the, the, the only fees on top of that you'd expect to see is the purchase of the take home AR systems. Uh, they are 1800 pounds. So you're getting a high fidelity system for 1800 pounds. The, the, the closest, the closest rival to that is um, the, 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 the more take home versions of the VR systems, which have zero haptics at 50 or 60,000. Um, and then the other, the other thing on top of that is the models. Jane, your question there of, of can, can a model be used more than one time? Again, a great question. Where we can make the models multiple use, we have. Um, a good example of that is the, uh, let me just come back here, uh, is the vaginal vault model here on the right hand side. That is a multi-use model because there's no dissection required. So it's just suturing. Eventually it will require a replacement, but um, that will get multiple, multiple uses out of it. The model on the left, the, the lap coli, because you have to dissect out the soft tissues, um, that is not multiple use and it is single use. Um, about 80% of the models in the platform at the moment are, are single use, and, and then you have the multi-use ones. So um, a lot of people will say, well, I, I want to do really high volume training um, in, a, in a training center. Um, this is where we encourage to say, don't buy one hub system or one lap AR pro. Um, if you were going to spend $120,000 or $150,000 on a VR system, the best bit is you can buy five of these systems from us. And that's five times 360 models with the annual fee every year. Um, and that's the, the case study that we did here. This customer, they purchased 10 uh, of, of the uh, lap AR pro and then they purchased 50 of the take homes. I think they, they, they so that they can run effectively two courses at a time, 24 and 24. Um, but because they have 10 um, hub system or pro systems, they get 3,600 models a year. Um, so ho hopefully that's answered your question, Jane. Um, I've got a, uh, another question from actually from one of our, our partners there from, from, uh, from NASCO Healthcare. Thank you, Rush. Uh, the question here is, can we see uh, an image of a surgical model? Um, Rush, the best thing to do is it's on the screen here. Um, the, the surgical model is, is, is what that instrument is holding on to. And it's on the screen with the vaginal vault, um, just with the digital overlay. I won't go through the rigmarole of, of pulling up a, 
another image but um, if anyone would like to visit our website you'll see some digital renders of them there um, another question from Jane here do we have any current US customers thank you Jane y yes we do um, I was telling them all off the top of my head uh, just coming the first thing that's come to mind is is PCOM Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine um, we've got plenty on the East Coast we do a, a great deal of work with the large medical device and medical technology companies so um, the likes of Cooper Surgical Ethicon um, Olympus um, who I'm sure you've all seen in that in that web app uh, their name popping up um, and of course we have a now a growing presence on the in, in the USA um, through our partnership with, with NASCO Healthcare and some other resellers. So um, yeah, that's certainly, certainly something we're growing, but we already have some very happy customers there. Um, oh, great, Jane, that's, that's brilliant. It's, um, Jane, I'll, I'll happily, if you want to drop me an email, Jane, I'll, I'll, I'll remember the names of the people that are there. Um, and the, yeah, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to, to reference, reference Innovus. I believe they have mainly our gynae simulators. Um, any any other questions? I'll pull back to my contact details so that um, they're there. As I say, if anyone um, if anyone would like to, to to gain some more information, I've already mentioned that we 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 ha um, have an excellent partnership with NASCO Healthcare on the ground uh, in the U.S. Uh, we also do provide direct sales and support there in the U.S. Um, and as I say, if you would like a virtual demo or, or any other literature, then then please do get in touch with me. I'd be happy to uh, happy to supply that and and support any needs that anyone has. No problem. Thanks, Jane. Um, so I'll, I'll happily stay on for a couple more minutes if anyone would like to ask any other questions. But um, otherwise, Olivia, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly all done with, uh, with the information I've got. Great. Thanks, Elliot. Um, I'll leave it open for a couple more minutes and see if anybody has anything. And then I'll, uh, I'll close it down within the next like three or four. That works for you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 